All right. Um, welcome back. And we're uh, just about on time here. So we're going to go ahead and um, start with our next session, which is going to be the Big Data Cup College Finals. Um, as a brief reminder, this session, like all of the sessions at the Ottawa Hockey Analytics Conference, is being recorded. Um, if you would like to ask questions of our presenters, um, you can do so through the Q&A. Um, and then someone, uh, one of the organizers, will try to uh, facilitate and funnel those questions to our speakers. Um, before we get started, um, normally at the conference, we're able to raffle off some prizes. And so we're going to uh, going to do that virtually um, this year. Uh, again, we're able to do that thanks to our wonderful sponsors. Um, some of them you can see, most of them you can see here on the slide, um, but we've got some, some great generosity. And so um, uh, first couple of prizes that uh, we're going to raffle off are going to be local. Um, so the, the first prize will be a Tim Stutzla t-shirt uh, from the Ottawa Senators. And the St. Lawrence women's hockey team has given us um, a T-shirt. Um, and so our first winner is Eduardo Reyes from Canada, uh, Ontario. Um, so congratulations. And we'll be sending you an email and uh, letting you pick, uh, pick your prize there. So congratulations on that. And then our second winner uh, is Stephanie Driver from New Jersey. Um, so congratulations uh, to those folks. Um, so the next step um, in the conference, our next session is going to be the Big Data Cup. Um, and we have three tremendous judges um, this year. And so we're very, very fortunate to have them. Um, Namita Nandakumar uh, works for the Seattle Kraken uh, as an analyst. Josh um, uh, Paul Camp Hart uh, works for the Bruins as an analyst, and Timo Seppa works as an analyst uh, for the NHL. And so um, they are going to be our judges for the next two presentations. And so the first of those, um, Devlin Sullivan and Owen Ricketts, are going to talk about determining pass value and efficiency in hockey. And so I'm going to shut up and let them go ahead and get started. Great, I can see your screens. Perfect. See your screen and um, yeah, go ahead when you guys are ready. Great. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. My name is Devlin. I'm joined by Owen. We're both juniors at Washington University in St. Louis, and we're going to be presenting our Big Data Cup research project on determining past value and efficiency. So just to give a quick run through of what we'll be discussing over the course of our presentation, we'll be talking about some of the background, the data that we were working with, uh, the expected goals and past similarity model that we developed in order to sort of round out the bulk of our work. Uh, Owen will be discussing some of the application of our project, both to tactics and pass selection, as well as player evaluation for the Erie Otters. Uh, we'll be discussing some areas for improvement with our work some further exploration we did, and then wrapping it all up. Uh, so just to sort of give you a sense of what we were working with, our data set was composed of 40 games from the Otters 1920 season. Um, at Hannock a couple of weeks back, Megan mentioned that the data was sort of modeled to be similar to things that are publicly available and scrapable. Uh, but one big advantage that this data did have was that it gave the coordinate data for both passers and the intended recipient and that was for both completed and failed passes. So that sort of inspired us to ask, how can we analyze what the probability of completing a pass is? What's the value of a completed pass based on the data that we were provided? Uh, so we wanted to develop sort of a flexible way to answer these questions and then apply them to relevant questions that the auditors may have. Uh, some precedent that we looked at was Daniel Weinberger's work on passing clusters. Um, if you listened to Ian's presentation yesterday, uh, for the Big Data Cup, you'll also hear a lot about that. 
Um, so to begin, we developed an XG model. Uh, a lot of the features that we used were sort of cribbed from MoneyPuck. Uh, we developed it in Python using tenfold cross-validation, logistic regression. Uh, the area under the curve score was 0.793, which compares pretty reasonably with a lot of what's publicly available. Um, and in order to validate it, we also prepared the distribution to MoneyPuck's current uh, XG distribution for the current season. And it was similar enough where we felt pretty good about going forward with it. Um, looking a little bit more at the past model, uh, we developed a K nearest neighbors approach where we compared each pass to its 50 closest neighbors uh, with the distance being the sum of the distance between its start and end point. Um, in order to sort of winnow down the data to something a bit more reasonable, we looked at only direct passes uh, at 5v5 in the offensive zone. Um, and then once we had sort of developed this model for finding which passes were closest, uh, we had to assign a value to each pass, uh, whether that was completion or the offensive contribution. For the offensive contribution, the pass value is the plus minus of expected goals in the ensuing 45 seconds after the pass was attempted. Um, and as for completion, that's just the fraction of completed passes among its nearest neighbors. And in order for us to apply these models, I'll pass it off to Owen to talk about some of our immediate takeaways. Yeah, thanks, Devlin. So the first thing we kind of wanted to do was a basic uh, sanity check to make sure our, our, our past similarity model was coming up with, you know, things we would reasonably expect it to. Uh, so with that in mind, we considered what the safest pass attempts, meaning the most likely to be completed, were as, lo as well as which passes were uh, the highest value meaning generated the most expected goals in the uh, ensuing 45 seconds. And we can see from our plots here on this slide uh, that the safest passes are kind of what we'd expect, D to D passes, uh, passes kind of along the outside of the rink, uh, passes that the, that the defense is not necessarily trying to, to stop. Uh, so it makes sense that those are high uh, expected completion passes. And then the high, the highest value passes also make sense. They're very short passes, so there's uh, there are, there's a lateral movement component, and a lot of them, which can be difficult for uh, defenses and goalies in particular to deal with. Uh, and they're all, as you can see, right in front of that in high danger scoring areas. Uh, so it makes sense that those passes in particular are generating a lot of uh, value. Uh, another another thing we um, wanted to check was we wanted to, we, we expected to see a kind of a negative relationship between the expected completion rate and the value of a pass, meaning the, the uh, XG that it generates. Uh, so, and we can see that's fleshed out kind of by this, by this plot here uh, as, so our higher expected completion rate passes um, are lower in terms of uh, value from, from expected goals. Uh, but are the passes that are, uh, less likely to be completed are the more valuable passes, right? They're the passes that defenses are trying to take away and stop from being completed. Um, and then our next, um, so, so we then went into a further efficiency calculation, which basically we took <clears throat> the expected goal delta uh, that, we, that we calculated, multiplied it by the probability of success to kind of come up with a, with a proxy for like who, which players are making, uh, which passes are efficient and which ones are not. Uh, and so we came up with a couple of use cases. The first one is that we evaluated passes that were uh, valuable originating from certain points of the ice. And so in this plot here, we, we have uh, pat, these are the end points of passes that are originating from the near point. And, and when we say near point here, I mean the, the point that's toward the bottom of the screen. Uh, so we can see that, that the most efficient passes from the near point, from the bottom point, actually go to the other, uh, up to, the, to the far point, right? They're, they're D to D passes. Uh, and, and so our initial takeaway here was that, okay, uh, lateral movement is particularly important um, for passing, right? We want we, uh, a, uh, an efficient pass, you know, forces the, forces the defense to move. It forces the goalie to move. And you can see there's a smattering of efficient passes also that come from the near point to essentially the far circle or right in front of the net. Uh, what we also notice is, is direct passes, you know, that, that stay in the, in the relative area of the far point. They stay along the uh, – or is, they, they stay along the near side here, uh, even though they may be high completion, expected completion passes because they're not very long, uh, they are not very valuable in terms of generating goals in, in the near future. Uh, the next area we, we considered was passes originating from right behind the net. 
um, because you know most existing hockey research shows that these are some of the most efficient, most effective passes that that can be made. And we see that's fleshed out by our data here. Points originating uh, from the trapezoid. Uh, the the best destination for those passes is uh, right in front of the net, right to the slot. Uh, they're very high efficiency passes. Uh, passing anywhere else from behind the net, essentially up to the point, you know, farther the farther we move away from the goal here, uh, the less efficient we are in in our passes. Uh, the next area of exploration was passes originating from the near faceoff circle. And here there's obviously no, just another very clear trend, right? Uh, you, you always hear get the puck to the front of the net. That's kind of fleshed out here. Uh, so passes coming from the circles, get them to the front of the net, get them to the slot uh, to create the highest danger chances. Passes anywhere else are kind of moving us away from our, our target and are not generating uh, very many expected goals. Uh, and lastly, um, we looked at um, pat the efficiency of passes kind of originating from the near corner here. And we and I think this is particularly interesting because what it shows is the valuable passes, in addition to being, you know, to the to the um, center of the ice, to the front of the net, uh, to the slot passes that we generally think of are valuable. It kind of shows that that passes from the corner, may, you know, uh, and I we kind of hypothesized that a lot of these occur as, you know, puck battles are won along the boards in the corner uh, and then passes are made is that we see the most efficient passes here go from the corner, go behind the net and to the near point. Uh, and it may be the it's it, we think it's likely the case that these passes themselves are not necessarily dangerous, but they are dangerous in the sense that they are they they may start a sequence of passes. Right? We already we already said uh, from behind the net passes to the front of the net are are very valuable. Some of the most valuable passes in hockey. Uh, so if we can if we can start a sequence by by you know recovering the puck in the corner, uh, passing behind the net, we may set ourselves up for a, a high a high danger chance, and that's. Kind of what we see that these passes are uh, are are um, are very efficient. They're generating a lot of expected goals in the in the next forty five seconds. Um, and then the next the next thing we did is we applied this directly to the Erie Otters to see which players uh, on the Otters were in in the 2019-2020 season or uh, were were beating their uh, expected efficiency essentially. Um, so the first thing we did was we we looked at. Uh, their completion rate versus the expected completion rate uh, of the passes that they did attempt. Uh, so we hear a notable name sticks out. Jamie Drysdale um, rates very well by this by this metric, right? He's expected to complete about sixty six percent of the passes he attempted based on what you know based on where those passes were on the ice. But by our metric, he or well, he did complete over seventy percent of those passes. Uh, so he rates. Uh, well by that that uh, methodology, uh, and then we the next thing we did was looked at expect uh, player efficiency versus expected efficiency. This, so this we we interpreted this as who is who is completing um, essentially basically the the most dangerous passes at a at a higher rate than um, than other players are. And so we see here we have names like Connor Lockhart, Chad Yetman, Ty and Sopa. They're they they do very well. Um, by this metric, because they're the, they're completing um, essentially high, uh, very efficient passes, passes to dangerous spots at a at a higher rate um, than some of their teammates. We also see here, and this leads into our uh, into the next topic that Devlin will mention. Our areas for improvement is that lot the majority of these players actually rate uh, beat their expected efficiency here. Uh, and so we think part of we hypothesis part of the reason for that is because we only had access to Erie Otters games, so we would have liked to establish kind of a, a better baseline for OHL passing uh, in general. That um, that will allow us to because this this we're kind of comparing the players against the Erie Otters against themselves and their opponents here, but not to the the league as a whole. And we think that would have given us a better sense for how good the Otters are at passing in general. So pass it on to Devlin for, for a little bit more. Yeah, a couple of areas for improvements that we identified were, first and foremost, leading up to goals is only a fraction of what makes a pass successful. I mean, it's more substantial and pronounced in the offensive zone. But creating space, uh, creating sequences, that's certainly something that would be worth investigating. Um, expected goals don't tell the full story. 
Um, again, as Owen mentioned, the data set contained only one team's games. So whether we were looking at just defensive or offensive, or ultimately as we decided to do using both to sort of round out our data, we're going to be disproportionately affected by the personnel or the tactics and strategy of the otters, either on offense or defense or both. Um, another sort of area for improvement is looking more into the predictive value of our work. I'll be touching a little bit more on that in a second. Um, and lastly, incorporating other players, both in terms of who's on the ice and who the pass recipient is in affecting the expected goals. That wasn't something that we controlled for, um, as well as incorporating who the opposition has lined up on the ice. Um, with regard to predictive value, uh, we took the liberty of training a gradient boosting classifier on past success data. Uh, again, this was pretty much out of the box on features that we already had included in our data set. And we were pretty encouraged to see, first and foremost, that on the right side of your screen here, the safest pass attempts more or less match up with what we have. Uh, again, considering that the X and Y coordinates were the most important features with this, um, it gave us uh, some good insight that the K neighbors approach is sort of factoring in most of uh, the important features in terms of pass completion. And it was also encouraging that for pass completion, there was a pretty strong element of repeatability in our sort of test uh, data section that we portioned off. Um, looking at sort of the same methodology approached and applied to uh, pass value, again, it was encouraging to see generally passes to the front of the net being considered valuable, uh, X and Y coordinates being considered important in determining this value, except the predictability and sort of stability of this uh, model wasn't as strong. As you can see, there's some kind of noise in the plot that we did manage to create. So uh, definitely some more uh, investigation needed to really nail this aspect of the project down. But in conclusion, we do feel pretty confident in saying that high risk and high reward passes are good and valuable and offer good payoffs to teams that are attempting them. Uh, with that said, a larger sample, more teams, and more robust uh, sort of predictiveness, stability testing is certainly something that we need to look at and press on with. Um, also, in terms of adding more features to our model, having the location of other players on the ice would be another big one. If you look at the NFL's next-gen stats pass completion model, uh, player separation, the pressure that the passer is under, those are some pretty key features of that one. So something to build on this model with would be those if those become available. Um, and lastly, while there is some room for improvement, you can make better passes than are currently being attempted. We noticed that a lot of passes along the near side boards from the points, especially direct ones, were generally inefficient. Uh, there's some room for improvement there, but it generally corroborates with existing research in the area and matches up with uh, hockey intuition for the most part. So with that said, that wraps up our presentation. Again, huge thanks to all of you and to everyone involved in this project together and more than happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the judges. Um, and we've got uh, close to about 10 minutes of questions for the judges, for the audience. Um, we're going to primarily focus on letting the judges ask their questions. But if we have extra time at the end, we will go through some of the questions in the Q&A. So uh, with that, I'll uh, let the judges chime in. Hi guys, uh, first of all, great job. Uh, you really covered a lot of ground, which made the, both the paper and the presentation uh, really interesting. So yeah, great job there. Um, I, I guess uh, my first question just has to do with, you know, I think it's really interesting and, and intuitive to see that kind of negative relationship between the, the completion probability and, and the uh, ensuing value. Um, but then when you end up multiplying it out for efficiency and kind of showing uh, those player level numbers, it seems like the actual spread of the values themselves is kind of not really that big. Um, do, you, do you guys have any uh, sort of thoughts on like what would actually be um, a, a significant or substantial difference between that, those player efficiency numbers, like a 0 0.02 versus a 0 0.03? Um, because just in terms of the magnitude of the numbers, it, it maybe doesn't feel, you know, as, uh, as large as, as some of those other metrics. Um, yeah, no, that's a fair question. I think with the Sample size also, if you sort of look here, if you look at someone like Brett Brissett, he played eight games. So that's where most of that difference is coming from. And with sample size, it all sort of like gets knocked out to the middle. 
Um, I think if you look at someone like Yetman with his passing, it's easier to sort of distinguish, but again, without having sort of uh, the luxury of more data or multiple seasons of data, it's hard to exactly kind of figure out. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also I also think to continue with that, we only consider passes in the offensive zone. So like, especially for like D-men on breakout passes, like if we were, if we were going to expand, like I think that would maybe be a place where a defenseman in particular could separate themselves in terms, <clears throat> sorry, in terms of efficiency uh, is, is by, by making, you know, being accurate on, on longer stretch passes and, and creating uh, maybe rush chances that way or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think I think I, I do agree with your point that I think especially for forwards within the offensive zone, it may be it may be just tough for them to really separate themselves in terms of in terms of passing efficiency. Got it. Hi, Aaron and Devlin. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. My question uh, is concerning your expected value calculation in the paper itself. Uh, I just wondering if you can kind of restate it. You seem to say that you're talking about only when there's successful passes. That's kind of what the XG plus minus is for. Um, so like, is the assumption that if an unsuccessful pass is had that the XG is uh, plus minus is zero or is there some other calculation there? Yeah, no, um, it's exactly like it said. It's only for successful passes. We looked at failed passes and it was all pretty cl closely clustered around zero. So for the sake of our project, we just all set it to zero. There was like a slight positive slash negative skew based on what area of the ice it was sent to, but it wasn't really too pronounced. So just keeping it as uh, zero sort of enabled us to go forward with our model. So you're telling me that we should always be passing the puck and uh, that every time people are yelling, shoot the puck, they're wrong. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go quite that far, but I do think when people yell, shoot the puck, it's not necessarily a super informed opinion at times. I'm just joking with you. Thank you very much for the answer. Hey guys, nice job. Um, your expected goals model use the um, value over the next 45 seconds. Um, 45 seconds is an eternity in hockey. Um, you can take a shot at, one end of the ice and it can hit the post or rim around, turn into a, a breakaway or an odd man chance and it can be back in, in the back of the net in, in the, uh, the other net in five seconds. Um, th there's no other sport where XG changes that drastically um, that fast. Um, I've, I've done some, some of my own work with tracking micro stats and pretty frequently a puckle when it goes into the offensive zone, it'll leave within 10 seconds. So um, I guess, did I understand what your model was doing correctly? And if you had uh, more time or more data to work with, um, how would you address this? Yeah, I think that's a very valid concern. And I think, yeah, like definitely, definitely that is something if we had more time, we would go play around with maybe test different, um, cause 45 seconds is a long time and, and it was a somewhat arbitrary choice. I, I think we could definitely improve by kind of testing different time intervals, like say starting at 20 seconds and then, and then maybe considering 30 seconds or, you know, and, and trying to distinguish uh, how, our, how our results, um, how our results look different if we consider different time periods. Uh, I think that would be, would be interesting to know. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll ask another question. Um, I, you might've mentioned it might not have, but I'm just curious if you guys had any thoughts on like uh, the, the value of, of the guys receiving the passes um, and how to address that rather than maybe just giving the, the sole value of the efficiency calculation or whatever the calculation um, to the passer themselves. Yeah, no, that's uh, something that I think we would certainly look to investigate more. It's certainly biased by who is on the same line as the passer in terms of how effectively they're able to sort of generate uh, expected goals. But with sort of like the, the constraints of the data, 
we just sort of left it as is and were able to like, you know, when we were plotting it out, looked at the, the context for, for what it was. Yeah, I also think that's, again, I think that's a pretty, this, this like concern is particularly important for like scouting data, right, at the, at the OHL level where like, like you have, you know, first round NHL picks on the ice with guys who will never play in the NHL, right? So there's a, there's a, like a vast uh, talent disparity where it might really, it might actually be significant. Um, the, you know, the difference of an, uh, the difference in effectiveness of a pass, depending on who is the receiver of that pass. For sure. Guys, can you pull up the uh, graph you had with the near corner passing strategy? Uh, yes, this one. So uh, I guess a question on the way that you've interpreted it, is it possible that the players who are making these, you know, very short and very uh, I guess negative uh, resulting passes uh, in a near corner, they don't have the space or opportunity to make those other passes back to the corner or across to the behind the net. Is, is that something you thought about and, and how might you tackle that if you were given something like uh, player tracking data? Yeah, no, that's uh, an excellent point. I think one of the things that, you know, other research and other sports kind of factors in is the availability of each pass. If you're assuming that every pass is available, which obviously it's, it's not, especially in sort of a congested area of the ice like this, you, you know, pass to the front of the net or into another dangerous area. But if like given the location of other players on the ice, you can sort of, you know, in addition to factoring in like the value of each pass and the predicted success of it, uh, the sort of availability of the pass would sort of be the a third missing link of some of our analysis. Very cool. Yeah, I, th I think I've seen some of this in soccer before where they have uh, kind of physics models to look at availability. So it would be really interesting if you got a chance to apply this further. Yeah, I think I'll just riff off of that. I think this was uh, this was one of the most interesting um, pieces that I saw. I think this links to um, whichever the, the passes that you had kind of going from, from behind the net directly um, to the crease or to the slot. Um, you know, I, I look at those passes that, that are in, in red there as you're setting up the next passer to, uh, to make that great pass to the slot. And it's not just to the slot, but it's to the opposite side of the goal. So, um, you know, def defense is reacting to changing to the other side, the goalie's got to make lateral movement, so on. So I think this is something that, um, you know, with all the papers yesterday and, and today, um, I think it's easy to, easiest to think about like, what's the value of a pass? Um, but especially watching some hockey this year, um, as we've all done, just like, not just like, what's the value of your pass, but can you pass to somebody that sets up another pass or opens up a lane? So um, just, just any comments on, on those thoughts? Yeah, I think that's, that's also right. I think that's, that's like a very, a very good point and in, in, in a very logical perspective to come at this from. And that's what, like, that's why I think this, um, this plot in particular here does best more so than any of our other plots is like passing, passing to, you know, a puck behind the net in and of itself isn't necessarily valuable, right? Un unless you can then take the puck from behind the net and then pass it to a, you know, a, a more dangerous area and create a scoring chance that way. And that's why we, th when, when we, when we measure our, our XG Delta as in the next 45 seconds, we we're trying to kind of control for some of that, where we say, okay, like, Maybe maybe that first pass from the corner didn't um, didn't create a high x or well, didn't immediately result in um, in a good scoring chance. But within the within the you know what you know in the within the time period directly following it, it did end up um, you know creating a good scoring chance. And you can see that also like like you can imagine a scenario that occurs often like in a in a in a hockey game, right? Where you get a you get a puck bat on the corner, the puck's won, it's passed out by the point, and then you immediately get like a D to D pass, right? And then you've immediately created 
um, in, in all likelihood, a lot of space for yourself on the ice where now you might have options for, for your next pass or shot or what, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I'm going to have to um, cut off the conversation there, but great job, Owen and Devlin. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're now going to move on to um, our next finalist, um, Ben Howell. And Ben's going to talk about how do we get there, quantifying past types and their value. So a bit of a theme here on past value. Can and everybody ben, see my screen? Yeah, I can see your okay. screen. So go Perfect. ahead whenever you're ready. Awesome. Um, hi, my name is Ben Howell. I'm a student at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm presenting How Do We Get There? Quantifying Past Types and Their Value. And that is the wrong button. Let me get that up. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I come from a baseball analytics background. And one of the really important ideas in baseball analytics is this idea of linear weights and how different actions, whether it's a walk, a single, or a home run, et cetera, have a different value when you're trying to score runs. And that's sort of the idea I wanted to try and translate to hockey when I started working with the women's hockey data. And sort of in that sense that scoring a goal is scoring a run and how do the actions, whether it's a pass or movement or a shot, contribute to scoring that goal. And to do that, I created expected attack value, um, noted, notated there with XAV. And um, I'm going to walk through that process today, as well as the second half of my project is looking at common pass types and sort of how successful they were using the women's data. And I mentioned my baseball background, but when I was trying to put together this analysis, it was heavily inspired by the expected threat work that Kron Singh has done. Um, and so just here's a quick comparison of the formulas that we ended up using. Uh, mine really changed the size of the grid and the, the grid that I was using for the rink versus the soccer field, as well as adding in an extra pass success variable. Um, so expected to hack value. To, to approach this problem, looking at the value of a pass from every single location on the rink is a lot of locations. Uh, so my first step was to divvy the rink up into 70, 10 by seven zones. Um, that was a little bit just an arbitrary number, um, but I think the, the size of the zones made sense uh, and it worked well with the analysis. And so the idea of expected attack value is to look at who is setting up good shot options, not necessarily who is taking those good shots, which is something we would use like an XG model for. And with expected attack value, you really have two shots. Um, you can either take a shot from your location or you can move. And the movement part, whether it's a pass or skating to another location is really the most important part of this. And the expected attack value score is the expected attack value of the zone you move to. And from that, you subtract the XAV of the zone you were in. So we're looking at the change that players, the change in expected attack value of a movement from zone to zone. And so onto the formula. And with those two movements, you can shoot or you can move. There's sort of two components to the formula. The first half is what I've been calling the shot score. So SXY is from a location, players have shot X percent of the time. And then GXY, given that they shot, they made that shot Y percent of the time. And so that's the first half. That's fairly simple and intuitive. The second half is what I call the movement score. So MXY is how often players move. So essentially one minus SXY. And then you multiply that by the sum of basically every possible movement that you could make and weighted by how often um, players have made that movement in the past. So PXY to ZW is how successful passes or movements from a zone to another zone have been multiplied by how often 
players have made that move. And so that basically, when you multiply those together, you get to, okay, this is how often a player moves successfully from this zone to this zone. And then you multiply that by XAVZW, which is the um, value of that zone in question. And then we basically take the sum of all those options and multiply it by the movement score or by the movement percentage to get the movement score. And what that allows us to do is that's basically the, you add that to the shot score and that's the value of all the actions that you can take from a location. And one of the ways I like to visualize this just to help is let me throw that up there is I put together a sort of companion shiny app for this project. Um, at the bottom is a leaderboard. I'll touch on that in a little bit, but the main part of this is to show that movement frequency from zone to zone. And so it defaults to this zone right here uh, with the black outline. And you can see that players move from it 100% of the time. Nobody's shooting, nobody's taking a serious shot from behind their net trying to score on the opponent. And the most frequent zones that players pass or move to out of this zone, zone 34, are gonna be along the corners. Now, if we slide along here to say zone 40, we can see that the percentages have changed. Players move from this zone 68% of the time versus they take a shot 32% of the time and make it 1% of the time. And then again, the darker red zones are where they more frequently move to. And then you can see the same sort of thing where the shot percentages go up the closer you get to the goal, which, which makes sense. And there we go. And so here is a look at expected attack value by zone, as well as an example of a play with what the expected attack value of each movement is. Um, what we see, what, I, what we see with average expected attack value by location, uh, is that the zones closest to the goal are have the highest expected attack value. That's not really a surprise. If we're looking at who's setting up good shots, good shots take place closer to the goal. So there's more value moving closer to the goal. And we sort of see that played out in this example. Now, this first pass. So in, in this scenario, a player received the, a player recovered the puck at this location and made a pass or movement to here, which is where the next recorded event took place. And this pass or movement has an expected, expected attack value of zero. And that's due to the fact that those two zones actually have the same value. So there's no real change. And but what we see in the, um, the next few events is that from here to here, they start to add value. And you can sort of see that where the zones start to get to light pink, light red, and eventually to dark red, where most of the value is being added on this last pass prior to the shot. And where one of the things for when players take a shot is in the current iteration of expected attack value, the value of a shot is the expected attack value of that zone. Um, that is something that I am looking at changing and is something um, I'm interested in exploring a little bit more in the future, potentially pairing the formula with a expected goals model. And so in this instance, um, I put together just sort of a basic XG model with an XG boost model in R. And I know that this shot had an XG of, I believe it was around 0.6. And so my thought moving forward is that there are two, two ways I can take expected attack value. One is removing shots entirely and just using it as a way to evaluate passing or B, pairing it with that expected goals model and take the difference from that expected goal number with the expected attack value of that zone to see how much value is being added by that shot um, to the point. So good shots are going to add a lot of value and bad shots are going to add very little value or even not add value depending on where you took the shot from. Um, but that is a future discussion. And with this current iteration, um, here is a look at the NWHL expected attack value results sorted by expected attack value per 100 actions. 
Um, and I meant I touched briefly on that XG model that is really just here for comparison. It's not trying to be anything um, super revolutionary. It's just here to look at sort of the difference between what expected attack value and expected goals might measure. And because what expected attack value is for is to look at who sets up the good shots versus expected goals is more for who's taking those good shots. And what we see is that the ranks are, are fairly different, which there's a lot of similarities. We see good players at the top. Kristen Luecki, Samantha Davis are four and five and five and four. Okay. That's because they're good players, but we see players like Sarah Eve Couteau Gudbu, uh, who is first in expected attack value per hundred actions, but 15th in expected goals. And as well as somebody like Jillian Dempsey, who is 11th in expected attack value per hundred, but first in expected goals per hundred shots. And so that was just sort of reassuring to, to realize that we are measuring different things, which is, which was the goal. Um, and then onto the Olympic expected attack value results. Again, a similar thing. We've got players like Jillian Solnier, who's first in XAV per hundred and 19th in XG. Same with somebody like Sarah Nurse has a similar sort of um, result there. And the second half of my project was sort of along those same lines. Now that we have, now that I produced values for each, for each uh, pass really, I wanted to look at which passes were the most valuable. And so to do that, I used a Gaussian mixture model from the M plus package in R and using uh, pass identifier variables like where the pass came from, where it ended up or was intended to go, as well as like how far the, how far the pass traveled and at what angle. Uh, I also manually separated direct and indirect passes because that's a, that's a pretty big difference that's a different type of pass. And I wanted to make sure that was reflected in sort of my final, my final um, pass clusters. And the model returned to 16 total progressive pass types. Uh, and in this sense, I'm defining a progressive pass as one that moves the puck 25% closer to the goal uh, from, what, from where it originated. And so nine of those were direct passes and seven were indirect. Uh, and up here, they are noted direct passes have a D in the parentheses and indirect have an I. Um, and then they're just all here for ease of viewing. And what was sort of notable to me when I looked at this was a lot of the indirect passes didn't, didn't add a whole lot, except for these few where they were sort of rimming around the boards or and really getting a lot closer to the goal. And whereas direct passes, especially ones that centered the puck, like these ones down at the bottom, had a really high expected attack value per 100. And while there were a couple that um, coming from the corners sort of back to centering the puck from behind the goal um, were, were very dangerous plays, even though if we looked at an individual play, that intended pass would have a high expected attack value, but the actual result might be negative because that's a dangerous pass. And if it's a turnover, that results in a negative value, which is why they resulted in some negative values. Um, but yeah, and so really the next steps that I want to take a look at with this, with expected attack value and this uh, sort of approach, I talked about better ways to incorporate um, shots and goals and how expected attack value deals with those. And as well as I'm interested in getting more flexibility in the equation uh, because as it's currently constructed, I did not separate for even strength power plays. Uh, and it's real. that's really something that I'd like to explore um, if we had more data available to where four on five or five on five, where we had good sample sizes for those. And I we weren't worried about um, one game or something uh, messing with our sample. Uh, other things are looking at 
successful and common pass sequences. So are there any particular sets of those passes that get strung together really well? Uh, and other things are looking at things like expected attack value and pass types by player archetype. Um, one notable player who wasn't represented on my NWHL leaderboard was Kaylee Fratkin, who had nine assists um, back in the Lake Placid bubble. And she had a high overall expected attack value, but she had a low expected attack value per hundred. And my guess is that that's likely because of her position and um, where she plays a lot. And I'd also like to look at things like this by minutes on ice, maybe rather than necessarily per hundred actions, um, just sort of account for how often players play, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I'm going to wrap up there and I'd like to give a big thank you to staff leads and everybody involved with putting together the big data cup and the conference and particularly for making the women's hockey data available um, as I had a blast working with it. And also a shout out to everybody who has done hockey and women's hockey analytics work in the past. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Great. Thank you, Ben. And uh, yeah, I'll just turn it over to the judges and you guys can chime in. Uh, hey, Ben. Um, I, I guess I'll probably just say this as a comment instead of a, instead of a question. Um, I, I think it, it's really important to um, do this kind of analysis at uh, even strength or five on five. If you're mm -hmm. met, mixing in um, you know, uh, power plays with, with even strength or even like five on five with four on four or three on three play. It, it's just completely different how the, how the ice is and, um, and how the defenses are set up. So that, so the values of those passes from zone to zone are going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the point I, I wanted to ask you about though, was the, um, you had an event cut off on the players of 150 events. However, a lot of the players that you had on the leaderboards had like 153 events or 160 events. I mean, typically, if I would do this kind of analysis, analysis, let's say the leaders of some statistic have a thousand minutes played, you'd want to cut off like low sample size players at like 200 minutes or less, something like that. But mm -hmm. um, here, your cutoff is kind of right up against your leaderboard. So uh, just just comments on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's a, a good point. Thank you. Hey, Ben. Um, I'll ask a couple questions, uh, but first of all, good job. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to do is steal concepts from other sports and apply them to hockey. So yeah. I definitely appreciate uh, whenever I can see work to that effect. Um, but uh, so a uh, quick question, uh, clarification, really. Um, so you mentioned kind of wanting to extend this by incorporating expected goals, but in, in your formula, it does seem like, you know, expected goals is, is part of the calculation in terms of valuing the shots when they happen from those zones. Can you just clarify a little what you meant there? Yeah, um, that's a good point. And that's one of the things, or as I was reviewing this and getting ready for this presentation, um, that I realized I need to go back more and sort of look at it and think about how that's set up. Um, yeah, because that really plays a big part in like where players are shooting from, how often they shoot and how successful they are is really the biggest driver in the expected attack value of a zone. Um, so that's sort of where I mentioned potentially just removing shots in general um, for the final sort of summation and calculation of the leaderboards, uh, just to look at um, potentially just passes as a measure of passes and then using a separate metric to evaluate sort of goal scoring and goal shooting ability. Uh, but yeah, that's a good, very good point. Okay. Yeah, got it. I, that actually uh, preempted one of my other questions, which yeah, it, it can be tough with this type of analysis to sort of uh, look at the the magnitude of like the, the pass values ver versus the shot values, because the shot values will tend to uh, in some cases just like completely overshadow them. So yeah. um, 
definitely smart thinking there. Um, and uh, my other question more to do with like application, you know, uh, it was really interesting to see um, the, the leaderboards and the comparison between expected attack value and expected goals. Um, do you view them as kind of more complementary um, and, and are I guess, attempting to make them more complimentary, or uh, would you hope that expected attack value kind of supersedes expected goals, or, or kind of what are your thoughts on um, using them all together to sort of evaluate players? Yeah, um, and that's a good question, and I think it depends, um, and it sort of goes back to the question you asked just a minute ago. Um, I think removing the goals and using it as a pass value measure is a good way to make it complementary um, as currently constructed. And obviously I do plan to go back and look at how goals are valued. And if I can reach a point where we're va- where goals are being valued or shots are being valued as their own be- being valued properly as their own contribution, um, then I think it could be something that sort of supersedes XG potentially. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind like the position of the player, what kind of role they play. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for making a Shiny app. I really appreciate the use of that. Uh, it's something that I like to see, and, and I think it's a skill that students should really strive to be doing. Uh, mm-hmm. And R makes it so much easier now. So thank you very much for that. It was fun to click around on. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, my first question is, I'm wondering, you know, Boston is playing today, uh, not the Bruins, the Pride. And so you've got some data there. What's your one quick insight to help them win the cup today? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, if they want to win, I should say, I would say that they should score a lot of goals, um, probably more than the other team. Uh, but I think like they've got a ton of excellent players. Obviously, they are heavily represented on this leaderboard. Um, one of the, the questions Timo asked about like sample size and cutoffs, like Boston and Toronto were heavily represented in the NWHL, so they were there a lot. They showed up a lot, especially with my cutoff being a little bit high. Um, but yeah, I mean they've got Samantha Davis, they've got Jillian Dempsey, um, and you know, letting your letting your players work together and yeah, they're, they've got a very good team and lots of good goal scorers. So I'm excited to watch them. Great. Um, and then my, my other question was about your zone sizes. And I just wanted a clarification from your um, shiny app that, yeah. So, so it looks like the zones in the last column, they include play in front of and behind the goal line. Is that true? Uh, all the way to the right. Yes. Yes, that, yes, they do. Um, and that was some, that's another, I think, avenue for improving this is just making sure that um, things, making that a separate column because play behind the net is a different, uh, is obviously very different from play in front of the net. Um, but that was not something I thought of at the time when I was just putting together the zones. Um, so. It, that likely impacts those um, those negative plays that you had for those clusters that were mm-hmm. um, near the net, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I had one more. Um, and and you know, I think I thought it was interesting. I mean, between last night and today, um, all of these these finalist papers were on on passing, and and clearly this is a new set of data that's. You know, becoming available through through tracking, and and hopefully we'll have this on the NHL side relatively soon too. Um, just a question to you, and and I, I'd ask it pretty much to any any of the other finalists. Um, you know, mostly I believe you put the uh, given the credit to the um, passer only. Um, just like looking at both the passer and the receiver ability. You know, on the highest level in the in the NHL. You expect everybody kind of to be able to to receive a pass well. Once you look at the minor leagues, college, junior, that may not be the case. So just talk about um, splitting up any any value both between the passer and the receiver, either in you know further work or, or whatever. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and I mean, obviously not something I really considered with this project. Uh, I think. 
I think one of the ways to do that, um, I'm honest, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would need to do a little bit more digging into maybe some soccer work or um, some of the other existing hockey work before I had a good answer on that. And I think this could, like I said, could vary by league where mm -hmm. maybe on the NHL level, it's good enough to model it as the passer, but for some other leagues, you know, it might be 70, 30 for, for like how yep. much skill is on the passing side and, and the receiving side. So um, I, I think it's, it's uh, worthwhile for, for other work. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Ben, if we have time for one more quick question. I'm um, not going anywhere. <laughs> Uh, I was just wondering about your calculation of the uh, transitional state probabilities versus the um, passing success. It sounded mm -hmm. like the transitional probabilities are built off of passes and successful skates, whereas the uh, passing probability uh, was built just on passes. So. It, is it really apples to apples? And then also in those uh, probability of moving from one zone to another, do you have like a weird, maybe survivorship bias? You know, the ability to skate to somewhere is, uh, is what's represented here, or you're skating to areas where events are likely to happen. Yeah, uh, I think those are all very good points. Um, and again, as I like put this pr presentation together after submitting the paper, um, just looking over at the data again, um, it's listed as past success probability. And what I was noticing is the way I sort of gathered the data um, and the historical events, it, it, was, it was more of a success probability. Um, so the past um, notation there is a little confusing, but I just wanted to keep it um, more consistent with what I had submitted on the paper. Um, and that's just another one of those things that I want to go back and check and make sure I did correctly along with looking at the like goal or shot um, valuation. Um, and could you repeat the second part of that question? Um, yeah. So uh, you have in the probability of moving from one zone to another, yeah. you have successful movements but it's also places where you can move to shoot, right? Because the only yes. other events you had were shots and goals. So does that bias the movement probabilities that you see? Um, and then I guess to that same point, did, did you test it all to see whether or not those movement probabilities were any different from like a completely naive, uh, you know, maybe like just a Gaussian distribution outside of it or even uniform, right? Okay. Um... It's a good point. Um, I did not do any testing like that to see if they were different. Um, and that's all the movements and the survivorship bias is another thing I would just have to go back and look at again. Um, I don't have, I don't have a good answer for that right now, but. Okay. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. A uh, quick question from me, uh, just from, I think that the previous slide you were on where you saw, where we saw the kind of sequence of the XAV values. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I guess, obviously, you know, this is very offensively oriented, but is it fair to say that, um, you know, actions and um, the D zone and the neutral zone, like really aren't contributing much to, to these values? Yeah. Uh, and that was, that was something I wasn't sure how to deal with initially. Um, and then I just kind of ignored it when I put together the presentation and figured I'd just work with what I had. Um, because I think that that is something I considered because those passes are important, obviously, you, to put together movement from one side of the ring to the other, you got to get from point A to point B. Um, but I think right now I'm okay with it just because, but something to look at would be, are those pressured? Like what's the relationship between those players and the defenders or the other, t the opposing team and how, like, how difficult is that movement or what's the pressure from the other team would be, I think, an interesting perspective to look at for those. For sure. Thanks. Thank you.
great. I think we're out of time. So let me thank uh, Ben again and thank our judges and thank the my lucky stars. I'm not one of them to have to choose between those uh, two talks. So um, our next session is going to be a poster session. And I'm about to post the link. So we're actually going to have you do that in a separate um, Zoom session. Um, Claire is going to go ahead, Claire, and post the information. And I'm going to post the link in the chat. And so we'll have uh, three breakout rooms within that. And you should be able to choose um, among those. And uh, we'll give some folks some time there. So there's the link um for those poster sessions and we'll go do that we'll give folks some time in there and then we'll be back in this main room um back again at two o'clock <laughs>